life is to be a child of God. Amen. Amen. And if you are a child of God, then wherever God is, then you know that you have all of the things which we have sung about this morning. We have that joy, we have the protection, yes, sir. we have the guidance, and we have the blessings that come from Him above. Amen. This, I believe, is just my second time here with you. And I am blessed tremendously to have been invited back one more time. All right. Uh, sometimes preachers always get to go twice to a church where they preach. All right. Uh, the, I've never known a preacher who ever preached that never got to go there twice. Some preachers, when they preach, and somebody might say, he only came once. Well, that was his first and last time. <laughs> but this makes my third time, so to speak. The time I was here and when I left, and now I'm back again. And we're just excited to be here with you to see the great accomplishments that you're making, to hear the tremendous singing and praises that are going up to God's throne. And you know, this is what He delights in. He delights in praise. And somebody said, why do they sing so much? Well, if you really want to go to heaven, I, I think you ought to know the answer to that question. Yeah. Right. When we get there, that's what we're going to do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to sing and praise God. Yeah. And this is just a rehearsal. Oh, yeah. And I'm just excited about the way that you sing. Yeah. And the songs that you sing and how you praise and exalt the name of the Most High, the Ancient of Days. The one who without him we would not have life. Amen. Because life is in God. Yes. Without God there is no life. I'm thankful for your preacher and the brethren who worked with him. Who thought that it was okay to call me back one more time. My history is, is just a history of being in the church all my life. Grandfather was in the church, mom was in the church, and I was in the church, and my children in the church, and I married a preacher's daughter. And so you know how that is. Well, no, you might not know how that is. Preacher's kids, they have it hard because everybody watches the preacher's children and, and if they turn any way but straight uh, the preacher got a problem but what a lot of people don't realize is that the preacher's kids learn what they learn from your kids mm. Mm. Amen. and if the preacher's kids turn out bad well he, he got a lot of examples that he follows after. Mm -hmm. But I'm just thankful that they thought enough of me to call me back one more time to think that I might have something to say that might help the church. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason that I'm here. I've been preaching too long now to preach for me. I've been preaching too long uh, to preach for money. I've been preaching too long to preach for anything rather than to praise and exalt the Savior Amen. and to say a word to Jesus. I used to preach and I would have one good sermon 
And it's only after I pass 50 that I learned how to preach a little bit. All the other times I've been trying. And finally I have learned to, to exalt the Savior. Try to hide myself behind the cross of Christ. And to encourage the church to do likewise. Brother Irving, I uh, have known of him across the years and uh, other members of his family that I'm very well acquainted with and work with throughout the brotherhood on various boards of the Church of Christ that we try to help the churches across the brotherhood. And I'm just glad that he is here in Florida with us. Y'all need to let him go a little bit so that he can get acquainted with some of the other people here in the state. And I know how it is when you come to church. You don't want some preacher to be going all the time. But at least let him go every now and then so that uh, other people can get to know him and be better able to cooperate with you here. You're doing a good job here and my job is to encourage you in the work. I'm glad to have my wife, as he said, of 58 years. She, uh, I've been married to her for that long. Uh, and she's been married to me for that long. Uh, we just have one. I'm glad to have that um, one. And, and, and she, she's my only wife. And I don't plan to have another. It's been a hard <laughs> <laughs> All right. But it's it's a beautiful road. It's a beautiful road. Every marriage is like a church. You know, Paul said in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, love your wife, Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. And he says, I'm talking to you about uh, the, the husband and the wife, but I'm really talking about the church. And so whatever goes on between husband and wife, the same thing goes on in the church. A little fussing, a little fight, a little arguing every now and then. And a little disappointment every now and then. But the thing that keeps it together is love, a commitment. Uh, we haven't had every day Sunday, and she'll be the first one to tell you that. And, uh, I told her though, any time she get ready and don't want to stay with me, just pack a bag and go. And, uh, and uh, she did one time. And I went and got her. And uh, I told her next time she packed a bag, to pack mine also. Because I'm going with her. Right? You know, you, you uh, I'm going with her. And she's been a devoted wife all these years, and I just want to, to share that with you. And I'm just happy to have her, and uh, I wouldn't be where I am now without a good wife. And she's a good wife to me, and children, all in the church, and we're just thankful for that. And uh, so we, we want you to know that we, uh, Daddy was a preacher, and uh, he's got some sons who preach, all of them in the church. And, and so we just have one big family. And I want to connect with you here today because you are my family too in the Lord. And uh, one of the things that's going to make it uh, uh, good for us is that we believe and practice the same thing. My grandfather, as I told you, some of you who were here the first time I came, uh, God blessed him to be the one who planted the church among black people in South Florida. Started in our living room back in 1928. And uh, uh, we had worship there, and then in 32, uh, we called down uh, Brother Marshall Keeble. We came down and baptize some more people. Uh, but that's where the church started. And, and then the Coconut Grove Church, and then uh, the church in Fort Lauderdale, which is now New Golden Heights. And that all came out of uh, our family's living room. 
But it wasn't so much my grandfather that did it, but it was God working through him. Because without God, nothing is possible. But with God, all things are possible. So I, I consider uh, the church uh, in South Florida as uh, my family having just a little bit to do with it. But God gets the glory. I say that to you so that you'll know who I am where I come from, right? and all that I've ever known is the church that Jesus built. Right. Through the years I have heard all of the questions, I've heard all of the arguments, I've heard all of the excuses, I've been in all of the fusses and fightings that churches do among one another. The church where I preach now, Three years after I was there, it had some trouble. And uh, uh, it was just through the help of God that, that I'm still there. Because I told the Lord, Lord, I, I am your servant. And this is your church. And whatever the outcome, whatever the outcome, I submit myself to you. And so whenever the dust settled, the congregation said, Brother White, we, we want you here. And I, with the help of God, uh, have continued there now. And uh, this next weekend, when you're celebrating, we're going to be celebrating, too, uh, the 75th year of Liberty City Church's existence. And then 35 years, and I just looked at that the other day when they had it up on the sign, mm -hmm. 75 year anniversary, Liberty City Church of Christ, 35 year appreciation for Brother White. <laughs> and I used to wear an afro. <laughs> it's kind of gone now. <laughs> I didn't wear glasses when I came. But I wear them now. And a lot of other things have changed. But God never changes them. He supplies our strength to bring us through the hard time. So church this morning, I'm not going to keep you long. I know you have a long day. But I want to get into the, the, the flow and to the theme of, of what you have been trying to do here for the past week. And that is to grow and I understand that this is what it's all about growing upward in the Lord uh, uh, for his glory and I, I want to say to you that uh, this is not going to be a shouting sermon right? All right. it is not going to be one of those where you, you get uh, oxtails and gravy right. it's, it's not going to be one of those kinds but it's going to be just a simple down to earth talk from an old preacher to a growing congregation on how we ought to get together, work together, grow together, mature together, and go to heaven together so we can one day be around the throne of God and sing his praises forevermore. My subject that's been assigned to me is let's, if I'm not mistaken, work together. Let's work together. When I looked at the word work, and I thought I knew what work was, and I've been working all my life. I had an uncle one time who wouldn't work. They were carrying him in the back of a wagon to bury him. He was still alive. And somebody stopped and said, where are you taking him? They said, we take him bury. He's so lazy, he just won't work. <laughs> He, say, he, he, he says, and we ain't going to feed him no more. All right. 
and say, we're just tired of feeling it. Somebody said, that that's, that's bad, say, you know, I feel sorry for him. Say, I'll give him a bushel of corn. This was back in the day, you know. He said, I'll give him a bushel of corn. And Sam Uncle rose up in the back of the wagon and said, is it shut? <laughs> and they said, no, it ain't shut. He said, drive right. <laughs> you know, Some people don't like to work. Some people say, work kill my granddaddy and, and I'm avoiding it. You know, but God made work for us. Yeah. At first, we didn't have to work. All we had to do, our grandparents. All they had to do was keep the garden of Eden. Right. Just look after it, tend after it, because there were no weeds, there were no sand spurs, there were no wild stuff growing in there, there were no thorns and thistles up in there. But everything was just lovely. And all they had to do was just tend to it and look after it. And they disobeyed God. And because of that, we're in this condition that we're in today. And one of the punishments that God put on mankind, and especially on the man, is that by the sweat of his brow, work. That's how he's going to exist from now on. So work has been a part of God's plan for man to exist and to be successful in life. You can't get by without work. You either work physically or you work mentally. But you have to do some kind of work. Some people, because the preacher works more mentally than he does physically, they think he doesn't do anything. You know? But all work, whether physical or mental, is still work. And mental work, the outcome of mental work, if you don't have the right understanding, will kill you faster than physical work. Mental work. Stress. Air traffic controllers. Die of heart attacks. Because of the stress involved in the mental work that they have to do in keeping the lives of thousands of people safe and giving directions to landing and taking off of aircraft. Policemen. They are stressed out and they commit suicide. Yes. Our soldiers coming back from combat, yeah. post-traumatic syndrome and all of those things, do the work. Yeah. And so work, unless you have it under control and understand it, can kill you. Amen. But God demands and requires that we work. Yes, sir. But the thing that we need to understand is he tells us that we need to work together in love All right. All right. and in peace. Yes. He tells us that we need to work together in unity. Yes. And when we work together, and that's the idea, let's work what? Together. together. Now if this work together has over a dozen meanings. I, I, I was surprised, not really, but just to know when I was looking up how I approach together with the congregation. Together means you take a piece of paper and you roll it up and the leaves come together as you wrap it up, right. you see. Together means that I call somebody from over there to come over here and we worship together. Together, together. Yeah, right. uh, together means that when I married my wife, right. that we plan to be Together, all of us. So together has a lot of uh, meanings uh, with different connotations and variation, but togetherness simply means usually of one, one, one coming together. All right. 
and, and, and as we come together, the word for our subject this morning is one another. One another. That's what the word really means, one another. You can't have a together unless you have at least two. You got to have at least two to have a together. That means one another when we come together. So God wants us, and the idea of work means force. It means energy. It means the ability to get stuff done. That's what work is. Work comes from the root word. Uh, well, I believe in the book of Romans, Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power. And when you look that word up as dunamis, it is the power, the energy. And we get the word dynamite, you know, from that. It's the energy, the force, the ability to get stuff done. And, and, and so work is the same root word, the ability to perform, the ability to get things done, to enable somebody, energy, to, to, to make things happen. And so God is saying to us, when we say, let's work together, number one, one another, we must congregate and come together in the assembly of God because God has placed us when we obey Him in one place and made us sit together. I believe I read that. He has made us to sit together in heavenly places. The church is a heavenly place. It is, should be an example of what it is in heaven. If you don't like it down here, you ain't going to like it up there. If you fuss and fight down here, God ain't going to let you tear up up there. And so we must work together down here in what? In peace. To get some things done. Brother Jackson told me, he says, I'd like for you to work from the book of Ephesians. And so I, I begin to look at this from that book. And time forbids that we read all of the chapters down from one to four. But I believe that the first three chapters, Paul uh, uh, writes to the church at Ephesus. And, and, and he had been through there once before, uh, and some brethren were already there. Uh, Quilla and Priscilla, they had been through there, and Apollos had baptized some folk up there. And you remember in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, that the Bible says, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples there. Right. He asked them, have, have you received the Holy Ghost? since you believe and they say holy ghost we, we ain't never heard of no holy ghost right. and he says unto what then will you baptize and they say we got john's baptism and then paul explained uh, to them that john baptized telling the people repent and believe on the one who is to come after him that is on Jesus Christ. And he explained the gospel to them. And when they heard that, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes, so if you've been baptized once, doesn't mean that you got the right one. <laughs> All right. And so, and, and so if you haven't been taught right, Amen. you can't be baptized right. Amen. And so they were baptized again for the proper reason in order that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Right. The Holy Ghost was necessary because they didn't have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament, but not the New. Right. And therefore the Holy Ghost was necessary to lead and to guide them into all truths and to bring things to their remembrance and to give them the ability, the power, the dunamis, 
to perform what God wanted to perform in his church. The first three chapters of Ephesians talks about how blessed we are. What God has done for us. The riches of God's grace. The great things that God performed on our behalf when we were without God and lost in the world and had no hope, no citizenship. But now when Christ came, he gave us everything. When God fixed it that through his blood, we might be made recipients of the salvation that was in Christ Jesus and we have been adopted and we have been predestinated and God has chosen us and through the blood of Christ he has made us his sons and daughters in the Lord yeah. and because of this because of what God has done because of the great richness and the great wealth of blessings that he has presented to us he wants us now to work together yes, for his glory. Right. And when I look at the things that he has done, I want to call to your attention for these things. Number one, he chose you to be saved before the world was ever formed. Amen. I don't know how old the world is. Some people estimate that it is billions of years millions of years old. I don't know about all of that. I just know that before, however old it is, before it ever got started, God chose you. God knew you. God presented you before the council that was in heaven, and he said, this person is going to obey the gospel. This one is. He didn't make you obey. He just because of his intelligence saw you obeying way down the stream of time before you were ever born, before you ever came into existence, God knew what you were going to do. And so because he knew what you were going to do, didn't make you do it, he just knew that you were going to do it. He formed the church in order that you might have a right to eternal life that Adam and Eve messed up in the Garden of Eden. And so God chose us before the beginning of the world. And then when he chose us, because man didn't do right, there became a separation between man and God and between man and man. There was a Jew and there was a Gentile. And God chose the Jews in order that he might make a way for Jesus to come into the world. And when he chose the Jews, Gentiles were outside. And therefore the Jews felt that they were better than everybody else. And that's one of the worst things in the world. When you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You think you're better than the other sister and brother. Look how she looked. Look at her hair. You remember that Dawson girl in the Olympics but won the highest honor in the gymnastics. You know what was it? Y'all know that little girl? And, and little, little black girl. And she won the highest honor. And guess what everybody said about it? Look at her hair. Look at, look at her hair. You know, her hair was sort of, you know, all over her head. Look at somebody do somebody. But what about her accomplishments? She could have all the hair she wanted. Amen. And not want a medal. Amen. You know, God knows the kind of hair he gives us. Yes, he does. But be satisfied with it. Amen. The Bible tells me that the very hairs on our head are all numbered. Yes, yes. Yes. Not he knows how many is up there, but every strand has its own number. Right. See, there's a difference between knowing how many is up there and knowing which one number 215,000 is, or knowing which one number 22 is. <laughs> see, see, <laughs> there's a difference. Uh, and, and some of us, because we have more than others, you know, we want to get inside ourselves. Amen. God knows how, how many, the strands of our, which number it is. Because when some sisters, when God count their hair, we have to count twice. 
You have to count the ones that he gave. We had no <laughs> and the ones from the Korean shop. <laughs> oh man, I can't read this. <laughs> but, but we have to, we, we can't think more highly of ourselves. We, we have to understand that God made us and we have to be satisfied with how he made us. When I was coming up, I, I was ashamed of my lips because because to, to be, you, you know, a good looking person and have beauty, you have to have thin lips and a straight nose, not a wide, flat nose. But they used to call me big lip. And when, when you saw some of my early pictures, my professional pictures when I graduated from high school, I would suck my bottom lip in so I wouldn't be big lip. Because you know how people do you? You, you feel that. You know, Mama used to tell me sticks and stones will hurt you, you know, but, but words will never hurt. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but that words will never Words do hurt. Words do hurt. And it was only it was only after I got after I got in college, you know, was reading the Bible, and and when Moses said, "Lord, you made me slow tongue," and God said, "Moses, who made your lips? Don't you know I made them? Who who made the blind? Who who made the deaf? Who who made folk who can't talk? I did it." Yes. So we need to learn to be satisfied with what we got and use what we got for the glory of God. God didn't make us all able to sing. I didn't, if I could sing like him, the church and I would be full. If I can't sing like him, he got all kind of talent. He can sing and he can preach. Look at him. And that's good. Amen. But I shouldn't be envious of that. You know what? We work for the same boss. And what he can do makes my job easier. He makes me look good because he represents what I do. We work together. And so I used to be ashamed of my big lips. I got to college and met Sister White. And, and we went out on a date, and I got a chance to kiss him. And guess what she said? Ooh, you kiss so good. were made equal with the Jews. You know our history. Black folk in this country. We were not equal. There were laws that segregated us, kept us from accomplishing this and accomplishing that. But when Christ came, he came to break down the middle wall of partition. It was first between Jew and Gentile. And the blood of Christ says, everybody now, God is no respecter of person. But in every nation, he that fears God and doeth righteousness is accepted with him. So the Jew and Gentile, they got together in the church. God made them equal. And he makes us equal today because if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Yeah. And by the blood of Christ, all of us are baptized into the one body. Yeah. There's a white church and a black church. That shouldn't be. And by that I mean, predominantly, you look like me up in here. And over yonder, all of them look together, except a few peppers that are sitting up in there think that 
the ice over there is colder than the ice over here. And Irving, Dr. Jackson, ain't got the same kind of information that somebody else got. All right. well. It's always, y'all are welcome over here, but it's always y'all come to us. Never some of us are coming to y'all. That's a subject that don't nobody like to broach. But I tell you what, if we can't worship together down here, don't you ever think you're going to worship together up there. It ain't going to happen. And I don't know who it's at fault. That's not the question that I'm asking. I'm just telling you to have the right mind, the right attitude toward that. And welcome anybody who comes into this congregation who wants to serve God according to the word of God. Work together with the poorest person. God gave instructions in working in the church. He gave instructions. Did you know that God gave instructions to the church usher? Do we have ushers in here today? Yes. God gave instructions to the church usher that he wants certain things to go on in a certain way. He wants the work to go on a certain way. God spoke to the ushers. He says in the book of James, he gives instruction to the church usher. You know what he said? He says, if a man come into your assembly, and he got on good clothes, yeah. rings, and all of this stuff. And, and, and move over, brother, move over. Move over. Move over right here, back right here. And then somebody come in here, right. you know, with raggedy clothes on, shoes turn over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody come in here with runs in the stocking, you know, and they wig on sideways. Yeah. And, and you say, sit back here in the back. Yeah. He said, you do wrong. Yes, Read it in the book of James if you don't believe what I'm telling you. God wants us to work together. Yes, None of us are higher than the other one. Yes, except when we work more than the other person. When we work more than the other person. Now, in saying that, I don't want you to get the idea that Brother Jackson ain't no better than me. Be a man just like I'm a man. When I say that all of us, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond the free, male nor female, that doesn't mean what you think it might mean. He is simply saying that all of us have the same opportunity in the church to be saved by the blood of Christ if we obey the gospel and live faithful to the end. That's what he's saying. But this idea that ain't no difference, you know, you're a man like me. Man ain't no male no female. It is. If you don't believe it's male or female, try going in the women's talk. Some of you brothers. You know what I'm saying to you? Yes, sir. That, that, that's not what he's talking about. Ain't no different. The man of God is higher than anybody else in the church. Yes, when he preaches and teaches the word of God because God raises him up to that level. Yes, does it mean that he is better than you? No. It means that the office that he holds yes, yes. must be respected. Yes, the elders, they are higher. They must be respected. He gave some in order that he might show how to work. He says he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists, and elders, and teachers. And he gave it in order that we might equip the church 
that we might know and teach the church how to do ministry. That's why he gave them. Because in every house, there has to be some order. There has to be some hierarchy. But the hierarchy is not for me to rule over you. But the hierarchy is for me to be the good example that you might follow as I imitate Christ. You see, God has always had a hierarchy. He said the head. But a rat is the cat. <laughs> the head of the cat is the dog. The head of the dog is the man. The head of the wife is the man. And the head of the man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. God is head, but there's a hierarchy. When I was coming up here reading, my wife drove all the way up here. I said, you only have to take it right above West Palm Beach. And then she says, where are we going? I said, Fort Pitt. She said, how do I know when I get? I said, just keep driving 95. And then she said, here's Fort Pitt's coming up, 14 miles. I said, just keep driving, baby. <laughs> and when she knew it, she drove all the way. But if I told her to drive all the way up here, that would come by. But the thing is, she drove all the way up here. And I'm sitting in the, I'm sitting in the passenger seat. She is under the steering wheel. Right. I am her head. Right. But it don't mean that I got to be under the steering wheel. Right. She's doing the driving. But she is listening to me. Right. Does it make me inferior to her? No. Only one steering wheel in a car. Right. And when you get five or six heads or leaders in the church, you know, and every one of them want their own way, you're going to have trouble. Yes, and it's good to have a preacher that knows that his head and the head of the church is Jesus Christ. Amen. Elders don't have any more authority than what the scripture says. The preacher has no more authority than what the scripture said. And when the preacher leads the scripture, he leaves his authority behind. As long as he tells you what the word of God said, he's in control. And God backs him up. And that's the one. God puts some in there in order to tell us how to do ministry and to equip us for the ministry to work out the foundation of God in fear and in trembling, in loneliness, in meekness, forbearing one another in love. Right. He wants us to work together yes, to do His will. Yes, and when we work together, can nothing stop us. Right. Right. But it's a hard thing sometimes to work together. Yes, Some time ago when Ringland Brothers used to come to town, and I don't know if it still come through Fort Pierce or not, but Ringler Brothers used to come to the circus, little circus used to come to town, and they used to have the different little tents up there. Come in here, you know, and see this show. And they had one tent, and back during that time, a dollar was a half a week's wages. You know, some people used to work for two dollars a week doing housework, you know. I, I came up during that time with my mom. Used to take in washing and iron, two dollars a week. You know what I mean? It, a dollar was something back then. With a dollar, you can get a week worth of groceries. You you, you can buy some food with a dollar. But now, dollar ain't much. But back then, a dollar was something. Pay a dollar and come and see a sight that you've never seen before in your life. A sight you've never seen before. A sight you'll never forget. And after he done hawked up the people and they paid their dollar and went into the tent and the curtain opened and, and, and what they saw was a rope. And then they saw a man, a black man, pulling a rope. And then they saw another black man pulling a rope right, right, right behind him. You know, and then another one came out from behind the curtain. Three of them pulling the rope. And then four. And then five. 
until there was a dozen light men. And then the curtain closed. You've seen a sight that you've never seen before in your life. And you say, well, what did we see? Twelve black men pulling together. <laughs> wow. You know, it's something that a whole lot of folks. <laughs> oh, wow. That's something that we need today. Wow. To see twelve black men pulling together. Right. Because sometimes folks have accused us of having a crab mentality. Right. And as soon as somebody get up a little high, you know, instead of letting them go up on your shoulder, you pull it down because he ain't going to get ahead of me. All right. That's not supposed to be in the church. We are workers. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 16, 1. We are workers together with God. Amen. And so we got to learn to work together. Amen. When I was coming up, there were a lot of things that we do now in the church and in our homes that we couldn't do when I was a boy. When I was in school in Nashville, we would get punished for going to the movies. And we used to sneak downtown and look around and make sure that nobody saw us. We would pay our 15 cent and go to the movie. When we got back to school, we would get punished. We would get whippings. And he would know, the dean would know that we went to the movie. And we never could figure it out. Until one Sunday we went to church. And we saw the lady who sold the ticket. She was a member of the church in another congregation. And she knew all of us boys in NCI. Wasn't that something? We couldn't go to the ball game. Because they say that was wrong. Because when we stood in the line to buy the tickets, we were standing in the way of sinners. And then when we got our tickets and went in and got our seat, we were sitting in the seat of the scornful. You know, when movies became acceptable for the Church of Christ people in Nashville and throughout the Brotherhood, there is a film strip called Jewel Miller Film Strip. They used to show these to convert people. How, now that I'm a Christian, how to become a Christian. And Joel Miller out of Houston, Texas, I know him personally. He made these film strips. And then he put from the keyboard. He made a black version of the film strips. And Brother Keeble was on the film strip. You must obey the gospel. That's what the Lord says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But before then, the movies were the devil's device. Yeah. So was TV. You couldn't watch TV because that's the devil's device. But we have to learn to use what God has put here to reach the masses. Yes, Amen. Amen. I, I, I don't drive a Mal T Ford like my granddaddy. Mal T Ford too slow. Fred Gita, one of our preachers who is now dead, he was called to a white church in the country in Tennessee to preach a gospel meeting. Fred Gita, if you ever knew him, stood about six foot four, weighed about 340 pounds, wore cowboy hat and cowboy shoes and was, you know, just a giant, good preacher. And, and, and when he was called, he just got married. He borrowed his father-in-law's uh, brand new Buick to go home, you know, to drive to the gospel meeting. He drove out in the country and came up in that brand new Buick and all around was horse and buggies and wagons and Maltese and stuff. And the white elder came out there and cover off. And Brother Jesus stepped out. And 
He looked at it and looked at the car and said, you, you're the preacher for the meeting? And Brother Jesus said, yes, I, I'm Fred Jeter. And, and the guy told him, said, and this is a true story. You can find it at Southwestern Christian College on tape at the midnight meeting. This is a true story. The man told him, said, you come here to hold this meeting, driving up here in a brand new Buick, and he had on coveralls, no tie, a white shirt. And Fred Jesus said, yes. He said, Jesus never would have come up here in a brand new Buick. He would have come up here riding on a donkey. <laughs> and Jesus said, and he didn't call it a donkey, he called it the other name. Jesus says, well, I says, uh, the reason I came up here says, uh, because it's against the law for your donkey, quote unquote, <laughs> to go on the highway and say, in fact, say, wouldn't be no hate up here for my donkey. And say, and if I were to put my donkey out there on the highway, say, the highway patrol would have put me and my donkey in jail. <laughs> And you know they wouldn't let him hold that meat. They sent him home. Because he had come up with something new. Some people in church think you have to stay in a horse and buggy day. And do not understand that we have to move with the time. It is not, I, I was in Houston, Texas at the Third Walk congregation before I went to Miami. And one of the brothers, he was a treasure of the church. He, he was the one who bought everything for the church. And he was the one that if it didn't go his way, bless God, I take it to two. It didn't go. All right. Because <laughs> I got to pay for it. I'm the treasure. Yes, and, and And I had to do the bulletin. And I had one of them. Uh, uh, hunting pet typewriters, but but mine, you, you know, y'all some y'all know what hunting pet is, right? Yeah. But I had one of those. I, I didn't do hunting pet. I did the Bible verse: Seek and eat shall find. <laughs> but anyway, it broke, and we needed a new typewriter, and they had a new typewriter that would print a whole line. That was before the word processor came out. Would print a whole line and would correct itself. The IBM came out with that thing. And I say, get an electric typewriter for me. I need an electric one. You know, this old one where you have to stop every time you misspell a word, you know, and put the white man on it. And it took all day to do the bullet. <laughs> and then this word processor would, would correct itself and do a whole sentence. And I say, get the electric one. He says, all right. And bless God, that Saturday I came to church to do the bulletin. I got the new typewriter. And I went in there and you know what? It was an old hundred peg typewriter. <laughs> and I say, this ain't the new electric typewriter. Well, you see, you don't know like me. See, what you don't know is when you're doing the bulletin, if we have storms down here. And sometimes the electricity go out. And you'd be doing the bulletin and the electricity go out and you can't do the bulletin. I say, heck, if the electricity go out, I can't see the do nothing. <laughs> In a church sometimes, you need visionaries to know what the latest stuff is. And if you are not the one who is doing the latest stuff, Yes, sir. Getting 
the job done Amen. and working together. Right. Now, look here. This might not be what y'all want, but this is where I see us today. God expects us to live together in peace, do His work and do His will. Amen. The church is simply a group of people Amen. who have decided to follow God's will together. Yes. Amen. Christ is the head of his church. Yes. This is his house. Yes. He says what goes on in the house. Yes. He has chosen all of us to be stewards or workers in his house. Yes. But he has chosen certain of us Amen. to be extra stewards over the other stewards in his house. He has chosen the evangelists, he's chosen the elders and teachers to be over the rest of us in his house. Not that we are better than anybody else, but he has given us that responsibility because we have given our life to this cause. And if you got a preacher that's been called by God, he ain't the right man. And if you got a preacher that does not listen to the word of God, he is not the right man. If you got a deacon who lords it on the rest of the people, I'm the deacon and it's going my way or no way. It's the hard way. He ain't the man that you need in the deacon. You need people who are going to compromise, but not compromise the word of God, but who are willing to listen. Yes. And to use sound judgment. Yes. And to use the word of God to guide us in all truth. Because after all, Jesus is the head of the church. Yes. And can nobody in the church tell you to do anything, spiritually speaking, for your salvation that is not written in the Bible. Amen. And if something goes on in the church, any leader with common sense would get a consensus of the people because they're the ones who have to work with it. But a good leader, because of his talking with God and because of his talking with the people, have prepared himself to offer some kind of guidance and different opportunities and objectives for us to follow after. And when these new things come, don't think it's a sin just because you ain't seen it before. Don't be like the brother who came out of the farm and had never seen an airplane. They took him to Hawkville Airport in Atlanta, Georgia. And they say, Grandpa, say, look at him. Say, this is an airplane. And he said, uh, yes. And they took him over, and, 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 and they said, you want to get a ticket? He said, yeah, yeah, I get a ticket. And, and they said, where are we going? He said, let's go to Birmingham. And, and they says, well, they said, what kind of plane leave for Birmingham? And the lady says, uh, 12 o'clock. And he says, what time does it get there? And the ticket agent says, a quarter to 12. He says, what time does it leave? He said, 12 o'clock. He says, what time does it get there? She says, a quarter to 12. She said, you want a ticket? He says, no. <laughs> he said, but I sure would like to see it take off. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, in Atlanta, to go from Atlanta to Birmingham, there's a time change. <laughs> See, Atlanta is Eastern Standard, Birmingham is Central Standard Time. So the hour is different. And so he, he, did, he didn't understand that. He, you know, he thought that was just a fast plane. <laughs> and we don't understand something, you know, get, get an understanding about it. And, 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 and we could work together. In the business meeting, everybody agreed. You know, they had bad lighting. I like the the, the, the indirect lighting that you have here. They had bad lighting. 
And so it was brought up, and that they should buy a new chandelier. And everybody agreed to it. And then before they says, okay, that's it, one brother raised his hand. And he said, I, I don't agree with it. And that's how one brother stopped the whole show. You know, cutting up. He just don't agree with it. We ain't all together. He's the only one in a negative mood. But he stopped everybody by all about we ain't all together. And when everybody's together, when he wants something, we ain't working together. When he don't want it, we ain't all together. All right. <laughs> and so everybody agreed, except him. And they said, well, why don't you want it? He said, well, number one, it costs too much. Number two, ah, uh, we don't need it because uh, ain't nobody here to play it. Say, what we need up in here is some mics. <laughs> we need lights. We don't need no chandelier. Because can't nobody play it and it costs too much. <laughs> What do we need to do? We need to understand that there's some things in the church that God didn't say anything about. All right. He never said anything about Sunday school. He never said anything about songbooks. He never said anything about PowerPoint. He never said anything about pews with cushions on them. You know, whenever they, uh, uh, the Word of God was read, all the people stood. Yeah. We sit when the Word of God is read and we stand when we sing. You know, that's all right. I ain't fussing about it. I'm just saying what the Bible says, you know. Right. Ain't nothing wrong with it. All right. But every year, twice a year, the people had to stand all day yes, when the priest read the whole Bible, yes, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, so wouldn't nobody have an excuse. Anybody ever been in the military? Anybody ever been in the military? Okay, you know that there's a uniform court of military justice. They read that to you every six months, so you won't have no excuse for breaking the rules of the military as a soldier. That's what God required under the Old Testament. That's why we have Sunday school and Bible school and Tuesday night prayer meeting. We have those things. The Bible doesn't say anything about them, but it indirectly indicates that when he tells us to do something, there's a way it must be done and we use any way that is not unscriptural and goes against the word of God. Yes, so this is what it is in working together. Number one, you want to find out if it's necessary, if it is needful, if it will equip the saints, if it will help the ministry. Is it scriptural? Does God say anything about it? And if we do it, will we be breaking any scripture? All right. And number four, if we can pay for it, and if it will help the church to move ahead, yes, yes. then we can use it. Yes. And so with this in mind, I leave you this morning in this idea of working together with God. We are called to build up and edify and equip the church to work together. Yeah. And each of us have this part. Now, we are called ambassadors of Christ. And the job of the church is to reconcile men to God. Our main purpose is to get people saved and to keep ourselves saved. That's the main purpose of the church. Everything that you do should be under that umbrella. If you are doing something that does not build up the church or get people saved, it is a needless endeavor. God did not call us to be busy. A lot of churches got a lot of stuff going on. They ain't got nothing to do with building up and edifying the body and getting us matured. Nothing to do with saving folk. Just entertainment, and when you do stuff just for entertainment, it's the wrong use. Right. It must be to draw people right. to Christ. Amen. Now I know that Jesus says in Luke 19 and 10, the Son of Man is coming to seek and to save that which was lost. 
But Jesus also went about healing folk. He went about counseling people. He went about having compassion on the poor and looking after the needs of folk. That's a necessary component because people don't care how right the Church of Christ is unless they know that you care something about them as an individual. And when you show mercy, when you show goodness and love to people, they'll come and become members and listen to the word because you care about them. Amen. Keep that in mind as you work together. And if you work together, as God said, work together, then God will bless you. I close that now. I close. When we obey God, God will bless us. Everything that we do in the church should be because God said so. Now, there was a king. And it doesn't matter whether you understand it or not. It doesn't matter if you see anything good in it or not. If the Bible says it, it's right. Because God is always right. This king called some people in, some young men in. He said, somebody has to take my place. And if you obey my rules, the one who does best in what I tell him will get to be the next king. And he called several young men in. And these were men who met the qualifications, good-looking, handsome young men. It was about 20 of them came to the king, and the king said, you must follow my instruction in order to be king. And if you do good, you'll get to be promoted. And so they all came in, and he gave each one of them a seed. And he told them, you plant the seed. I want you to come back in six months, and the one who has the best flower who seen grows the best, who has the tallest flower, the most good-looking flower, he gets to be king. But remember, you must follow the rules and only use this seed. So they gave him the seed, they went away, and they talked with one another from time to time. And the, the flowers began to grow, except one man's flower, it wouldn't grow at all. It didn't grow at all. And, and he told his father, Father, what's wrong? My seed didn't germinate. It didn't grow enough. It didn't sprout up. And his father said, let's change the soil. So he changed the soil. And two weeks later, it didn't do anything. He said, let's sit it out in the sun. Sit it out in the sun. And it didn't do anything. Let's put some water on it. Put water. Let's fertilize it. It didn't do anything. And pretty soon, after five months, the seed had not come up. And all of the other friends, their flowers were blooming and growing tremendously. And he says, what are we going to do? And he said, Daddy, he said, Daddy said, let's just go buy another seed and another flower. He said, no, son. He said, your seed just didn't come up and said, you follow the king's all. And of course, he was embarrassed. On the day of reckoning, everybody came in with their plan and set them down before the king. And they were all beautiful, grown. And then he called on this young man, where is your plan? And with a bow down here, he came up and he set the empty pot there. And he says, I tried. I tried, Your Highness, to follow the rules and do everything that you said do. He said, but no matter what I did, the seed just didn't come up. And he says, I'm so sorry I failed you. And the king looked at all of the other plants and the other young men were standing there gloating and smiling because they knew that they would be king. The king says, now, he says, I'm going to present to you our next king. And he pointed to the man whose flower didn't come up. He says, come on up here. He says, you're the next king. He says, you see, I don't know where these other flowers came from. But before I handed out the seeds, I boiled them. And they were not supposed to come up. He said, so these must be imitation seeds or plants that you got from somewhere else. But this young man, in spite of the ridicule, the shame, and all of the oppression, says he came, he did like I said, so you are honorable, you follow my rules, you are worthy to be king. 
God has given us instructions in the book of life. We are to follow them. When people cuss us out, pray for them. When they do us wrong, do good to them. When they mistreat us, pray for them. Because we are doing what? The will of the Father. When folk, as much as possible within you, that lie within you, live peaceably with everybody. Don't stop no fun. God says if you offend somebody in the church, it's better the big rock be tied around your neck and somebody throw you in the ocean than to cause a child of God to be offended and to go astray. So we have to treat one another with love. Take wrong. Eat crow. People do you wrong. Do good to them. When you work together, sometimes folk want to have that way, let them go. Because the work that God does not approve of, he'll bring it to an end. You ain't got to worry about that. And in so doing, you fulfill your mission. And so you'll be a servant of God, and God will give you a great reward if you work together in love and peace and harmony with all the rest of the church. And we as workers together and ambassadors with God, doing the will of the Father, one day God will say, well done, good and faithful servant, and you get thrown in. God bless you.